Welcome back to another episode of Opal Wave MTG, a channel dedicated to exploring power levels in EDH and helping you evaluate your commander deck's power level. I'm your host Jacob, and today we're going to be reviewing Satoru Umazawa, a creature recently uh, spoiled for the Kamigawa and Neon Dynasty sets. And Satoru is a 3 mana Demir creature with whenever you activate a ninjutsu ability, look at the top 3 cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest to the bottom of your library in any order. This ability triggers only once each turn. Each creature card in your hand has ninjutsu, 2, blue, and a black. And ninjutsu basically reads, return an unblocked creature to your hand to put the creature to, uh, you want a ninjutsu into the battlefield, tap attacking, and unblocked. As usual, the deck lists are in the description, and if you are new to the channel, be sure to check out my intro video for more context on the power levels I'll be using. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So, Satoru really wants to cheat the creatures into play, which can be difficult to manage if your playgroup plays on the lower end of the power level spectrum. In order to keep the power level low, I decided to go with Demon Tribal. Demons have a decent impact on the board, but most of them won't have a game-ending impact on an individual play basis. Uh, this gives our opponents time to respond and create board states of their own. Uh, as you can see here, we've got our demons, and we've also got some smaller creatures to help us enable Satoru. Uh, we've also got a few creatures like Grey Merchant of Asphodel and Noxious Gear Hulk to kind of fill out the rest of the, the creatures here. So the sorcery section is pretty straightforward. We've got a couple of board wipes, Black Sun's in it, Decree of Annihilation, and Flood of Tears. Good way to balance everything, and then we can like replay one of our demons, and Knight's Whisper, and read the bones as uh, just ways to draw the, for the early game. Then moving on to the instance, uh, it's primarily uh, counter magic because our creatures have destroy on them already like meteor golem noxious gear Hulk, overseer of the dam so it's better for us to supplement our removal with counter magic uh we of course we've still got a few removal spells in here um but for the most part we don't, we want to prioritize counter magic here for the artifacts we've got a mixed match of two and three mana rocks as well as gilded lotus and a hedron archive our cmc is kind of on the high side so these two will really help us propel into the six and seven mana ranges. Then we've also got Mask of Grizzlebrand, since we're on the Demon Tribal. Uh, figured it'd be fun to throw it in here. Gives lifelink and a little bit of draw power on it as well. Then we've got Biden of Thassa to give us some extra utility for our unblockable creatures, and a Whip of Erebos to give our team lifelink and to do some uh, reanimating every once in a while. Then our uh, enchantments are pretty straightforward. We've got Deep Freeze, just an extra removal spell. Liliana's Contract, if we have four more demons at the beginning of our upkeep with different names, uh, you win the game. So since we're playing Demon Tribal, uh, thought it'd be fun to throw this one in here. You also get to draw four cards when it enters the battlefield at the cost of four life, but that's not too bad. Reconnaissance Mission, uh, just some extra redundancy on the body of the Thassa effect, and a Reflections of Lit Jara. Uh, we're not always going to have Satora out on the field, so if we do have to cast our demons, might as well get two of them, right? So the lands are pretty straightforward since we're playing two colors and don't have a ton of intensive mana costs. It's okay for us to run a decent amount of basics. Plus with our ramp package we should be more than fine. A uh, couple of utilities like Ghost Quarter, Field of Ruin to deal with lands that we don't want to see on the field anymore. And a Bajuka Bog to hit graveyards if we really need to. Moving on to the battle power level of Satoru Mazawa. As you can see we've kind of beefed up our creatures a little bit here. Most notably Blightsteel Colossus is basically just a one hit uh, take out a player. Uh, some other cards like Agent of Treachery, um, kind of on the ruder side, uh, basically stealing our opponent's stuff. And then we've also added Giant Whale and Peregrine Drake. So uh, essentially how this works is you're going to ninjutsu in one of the Peregrine Drake or the Great Whale and that's going to untap the lands you control. So as long as you have five lands uh, you're good to go. Uh, but what you do is because they enter still unblocked, you can continue to ninjutsu them in over and over and over again. So you continue to swap back between Great, Great Whale and the Peregrine Drake to create infinite mana. And then once you have infinite mana, you can continue to uh, ninjutsu in whatever creature you want to. So if you hit like an Agent of Treachery, you can gain control of uh, all the permanents on the battlefield. Uh, 
or you can uh, with the parasitic strix uh, you can uh, drain everyone's life um, or with Gary Merchant of Asphodel you can do the same thing and also some of our uh, creatures in the deck are going to have a little bit more utility so if you have a baleful strix this enables the ninjutsu and is an outlet for the combo as well because you can continue to draw your library until uh, you hit one of your outlets and then you can just win the game from there moving on to the sorceries uh, still pretty simple here we've added a couple of tutors uh, an extra turn spell because uh, why not and uh, our instants are mildly upgraded from the previous version, uh, kind of just dropping some of the three mana spells uh, like the Dissipate and the Cancel in favor of some cheaper costed removal and some overall take care of anything uh, like Into the Royal. And same kind of concept with our artifacts. Again, we've reduced the three mana cost artifacts and added more two mana cost artifacts. Skyclave Relic has some extra utility as it can be three, but also if you pay six into it, you get two additional ones. So maybe like a slightly over costed Gilded Lotus just to help us cast some of our bigger casting stuff in case we lose uh, Satoro. We've gone to the enchantments. So I basically just consolidated it down to Coastal Piracy and Reconnaissance mission to give us extra utility. Uh, basically just like the Biden of Thassa. Uh, moving on to the lands, just made some slight upgrades, added a few more dual lands to the deck, uh, cut back on the basics since our deck is primarily skewed towards blue, uh, left in more blue basics than the black basics. Before we move on to the glory section, if you like what I'm doing, think this content is cool, go ahead and give me a like, subscribe, and leave a comment letting me know what commander you'd like to see built next. And finally, we've got the glory version of Satoru Mizawa. And I could have gone two different ways with this deck. You could either opt to cheat in some big fatties like Razakath, Jinjutaxius, Consecrated Sphinx, uh, just some really powerful game ending creatures. Or I could have gone all in on the Greater Whale Peregrine Drake interaction. And I decided since Satoru has such a unique interaction with these cards, I would go all in. Uh, and I did that by adding some extra redundancy on the Palachron, as well as making our win cons um, a little more efficient. Like the Cauldron Familiar is a way to drain our opponents, only costs one mana, so we can drop it early and potentially have it trigger our ninjutsu ability. Um, and then we've also got Dimensional Infantrator. It has flying, so it itself can, again, be a ninjutsu target. And it has... Uh, Pay two mana, target opponent exiles the top card of his or her library. If it's a land card, you may return Dimensional Infantrator to its owner's hand. So basically, we create infinite mana, and with the infinite mana, we can use the Dimensional Infantrator to exile our opponent's libraries. And one of our final ones is going to be Thassa's Oracle. And this is nice because we get to layer this in with Tainted Pact and Demonic Consultation. So it makes one of the best win cons in the format layered into our main strategy here. So very cool. For the sorceries, we're going a little bit more aggressive with our tutor package. We've got Demonic Tutor, Diabolic Intent, and Imperial Seal, as well as Peer into the Abyss. It's an extremely powerful card draw option. And then we've got Gataxian Probe, so we can take a peek at the control player's hand before we try to go off. And a Toxic Deluge is just a fantastic board wipe in the format. And in our instant section, you can see some pretty stark changes here. Um, we've got the rituals, like Dark Ritual, Cabal Ritual, to help us cast our Adnaz and our Appearance of the Abyss a little bit quicker. And then our removal suite is pretty stock for what you for what a blue-black control list would, would want. Uh, a lot of cheap interaction. Um, the big thing we're missing here is uh, Force of Will and the Deadly Relic, both of them, since our deck is a little bit higher on the CMC side with like the Greater Whale and the Palancron, uh, I kind of wanted to reduce the overall CMC in other sections of the deck, so I opted to cut Force of Will and the Deadly Relic, just so we don't hit ourselves too hard on the Adnaz here. Moving on to the artifacts, uh, we've consolidated our rocks to primarily two and zero cost artifacts. Um, as well as adding in a little bit of stacks like Dampening Sphere and Craft Digger's Cage, both fantastic for either stopping Storm players that we can also play around with our Ninjutsu ability. And the Craft Digger's Cage just stops so much in the format. You can't tutor to the library, so uh, 
and you can't cast spells from your graveyard, so Underworld Breaches is going to get hit really hard with this card. Then moving on to our enchantments, we kept it pretty simple here, just a Mystic Remora and a Ristic Study. If you really wanted to, you could add a uh, Necropotence, but I didn't feel like it was too necessary. And moving on to our land base, so this land base looks kind of weird at first, just because we only have the two basics in here. Um, well, four really, if you can count the Snowlands, and that's because this is what's called a Tainted Pact mana base. So with Tainted Pact, uh, you exile the top card of your library, you may put that card into your hand unless it has the same name as another card exiled this way. Repeat this process until you put a card into your hand or you exile two cards with the same name, whichever comes first. So if you want to run this card with Thassa's Oracle, uh, you have to run a literal singleton deck. So in order for our land base to work, we have um, a lot of the pain rainbow lands, um, pretty much every fetch land that we can uh, get our hands on. Um, and then of course we're splitting up our basics between the snow and the regular lands. And this pretty much guarantees that if we hit our Thassa's Oracle and Tainted Pact that we are going to exile our entire library. Uh, Demonic Consultation fortunately does not have that same interaction. You just name a card and exile until you uh, find the card that, that you were looking for. So you can just name a card that doesn't exist in your deck and um, exile your entire library. Keep a note that you do exile the top six cards of your library before you start looking for the card. So if you're using this as like a, a tutor, it can be a little bit risky. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Opal Wave MTG. Again, I'm Jacob, and if you like this content, go check out the other videos I have up. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time.